very glad that you're here this morning. Um, this session is called Real Coding for Real People, and it is my distinct pleasure to welcome Carl Erickson this morning. Carl is co-founder and president of Atomic Object, which is a software development firm here in Grand Rapids. Um, so would you please join me in welcoming Carl Erickson. Such a small and nice crowd. You should all come and sit right here. None of this back of the audience thing, back of the seat. Come on, come down here. It's goofy being back way back there. I was a professor for 10 years, so I know these tricks, you know. Um, I am actually Drew today. That's what uh, my friend Ben up in the booth tells me. Um, yep. Drew Colthorpe was originally scheduled to do this, and I asked Drew to go and exercise his uh, amazing brain and communication ability on behalf of the company in Boston. And he said, well, that's great, but uh, I'm going to screw Jesse if I do that. I said, well, maybe that's not so good. I can help out there. So I'm filling in that way. So um, I want to tell you a little bit about Atomic, because I think we're going to have plenty of time and, and more than welcoming questions. And it seems to me that if I'm going to be persuasive at all to you, that you should know who the hell I am and where I come from and what I do. So these are brief slides about answering those questions. Oh, wait, I got this fancy little clicker thing here. Let's try to do this. This was Atomic circa 2001. It was me with a ponytail. You can't see the ponytail, unfortunately. And my partner, Bill, on the left to me. And then uh, a bunch of students from Grand Valley. Those were our first employees. We started our company after I left the university. I taught at Grand Valley for 10 years. We build software for other companies. We're an innovation services firm. We uh, are really good at building software products, and we sell that service to other firms, firms from startups to Fortune 500 companies and everyone in between. So that's what we looked like 10 years ago. This is what we look like today. There's a few employees that we've hired who aren't in this picture, but as you can see, a substantially uh, bigger and more diverse, a slightly more diverse group. It's pretty tough to hire women in computer science and virtually impossible to find minorities and women together in computer science. The dog is our security officer. Our building is on Wealthy Street. I'm not sure how much of this, nope. Uh, our building on Wealthy Street is at Diamond. Uh, we moved in there in 2003 and uh, occupy both floors of that now. So here's what we do. We build web products. That's one of the big things we do. This is a product that Drew actually worked on, probably why it's in his slide deck, called Catalog Choice. It's like the don't call list of paper catalogs. We build mobile applications for people. This is the Art Prize voting app. Any of you happen to have used it on your smartphone? Um, we built that uh, three years ago and have maintained it since then and added a few features. We actually do embedded development, which is the kind of computers that surround us everywhere that no one is really particularly aware of, like in your car or you know, in your smartphone or in this little clicker and that kind of thing. Um, and they tend to look like that rather than what we think about as a computer. Uh, oops, there is a picture there. That's our building on Wealthy Street. This is where we do our work. This gives you an idea of um, what it's like in the company by showing you pictures of how we work. I think it says a lot. So one big open space. This was taken on a day when nobody was in, at work for some reason. I don't know what's up with that. Um, we do a lot of socializing together. This is a party we had about a year ago for celebrating something or other. A little jazz band there. That's a typical sort of work approach. We do very collaborative work. Uh, there's actually something called pair programming going on there with the two guys sitting right next to each other, one computer, two people, tons of communication and collaboration in order to get the best uh, product out. Uh, we keep track of stuff that we care about, like the pictures of little kids, collective pictures of kids, and how the status of our projects. Red means it's busted, something's ba bad, and green means it's good. Um, there's another information radiator. This is actually a really interesting one. Um, one of the things that's, uh, I'm going to talk like real specifically about why it's important that you be able to write at Atomic and the role that writing, effective communication and writing plays. Um, but what this is illustrating is one of the um, uh, ways that, that's internally important. We market our company uh, by primarily by sharing how it is we do things. And we talk about like our technical approaches. We talk about our project management approaches lessons learned, cool tools we found, all sorts of things. And we do this all through a blog. So we have 30-odd people uh, writing into a blog, spin.atomicobject.com. And we keep track of that, uh, of who's contributing to there, by this bar on the bottom, which shows uh, whether or not you've 
contributed to the blog lately, basically. So out there right in the office on a big screen TV. Um, we do things like whiteboards in order to, you know, get shared ideas out. Obviously, there's some, some writing in here, but very sort of, it's almost more like diagramming. Um, a lot of collaboration with our customers. This is a session where we're, we brought a couple of, uh, we have a customer in San Francisco called uh, SideReel. They are sort of like what I think about as the TV guide for the web and now mobile. We built a mobile app for them. You guys are probably too young to remember what the heck TV guide is, but this is like the modern version of it. Anyway, they came in from San Francisco to work with us on, on, design, on building the mobile app, and uh, we spent a lot of time with them downstairs putting stickies and big pieces of paper on the wall to try to figure out what it is we should build. No, no, uh, no coding that whole week. Uh, this is a product backbone. Um, interesting uh, aspect here of like super compact writing, like one little phrase carries a whole lot of meaning and is a heck of a lot more efficient than uh, you know, sketching out at a, um, at, a, at a detailed, writing down at a detailed level. One of the aspects of writing that we see lines up very well with development is there's this iterative nature to it. So you might start really broad and without lots of detail, just sketchy. And then over time, as the project goes on, you resolve these, each of these cards can become like a whole you know, set of features for the application and might have a lot more writing associated with them, both computer language and English language, as you further think it through. Uh, picture of Sean Crowley's hands. Some more sketching and writing. Figuring out what a mobile app should look like. Wireframing, prototyping, more pair programming. Somebody's awesome bicycle in front of our building. So that's Atomic. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have about that while I switch slides. Let me just close these guys. Okay, so now I'm gonna, now I'm gonna flip to Drew's slides. And real code for real people. Real code for real people, that's interesting. So I think what he's noticing, has noticed, being a reflective and, and smart guy, is that there is a, a real strong connection um, between writing and software development, but not in sort of the obvious way of like you literally put characters into a document, more at a higher level way that they're both creative processes and there's a lot of overlap there. Um, so this is what I just went through, skip that one. So while the obvious things about writing, which I'm going to hit at the end, email and status updates and requirements and stuff like that, which are absolutely critical, uh, they're a little bit sort of obvious. So instead, let's talk about the more interesting things first. Learning, uh, writing as a creative process, software development as a creative process, where's the overlap there? What's, what are the principles? One of the things that we use um, writing for when we start a project is we use it to organize our thoughts about who are we building a product for, for building a mobile app. We gotta think about who, who is it that's going to be using this thing. And it's easy to sit in the room and talk about it, but it brings a certain discipline to you if you actually record it. And so we use something called personas where we literally pick a name. You can see like Brett and Robbie and Brad. And we pick a picture so that we have this mental image. And then we have some basic demographic stuff, age, et cetera, what kind of job they do. And then a little tagline like Robbie's is, if I don't have pictures, it's as if it didn't happen. That represents Robbie to us. And then we go into their values and what they do on a daily basis and what they care about, what their goals are, what their life distractions are. You know, we would describe Robbie as 20-something, lots of hobbies, lots of friends, lots of social networking, views his job as like, you know, can do it anywhere, anytime, doesn't really like a lot of eight to five structure. You know, we would spin a little story about this person. And then we document it here. We take these personas and we make them a part of the project and we use them as a touchstone for while we're working, trying to decide what to build. So we come back to here and let's say like you and I are talking as developers, like what is this feature all about and what are we gonna do with it and how is it gonna look? Then if you and I disagree, like oh, I think it should be this way, you think it should be that way, this is a nice place to come back to to try to resolve those disagreements. Like, well, what, what would Robbie care about? Is this feature gonna help Robbie? Is it gonna get his job done? Will he care about it? 
This is a nice touchstone for that. So this is where something that you've written at the front of the project carries on throughout the duration of the project to help you stay on track and guide what it is you're doing. I want to talk about a particular project. This is another one Drew worked on uh, called Kid Intelligent. We launched this product in January, I think, and uh, in, Jan in January, yes. And this product is a resource for parents who care about helping their kids get along better, do better at sports, do better at schools. And what it does is it identifies, after you fill out a survey, it identifies your kid as one of, I think, 16 different personality types. And then it gives you practical advice for that personality type about how to help your kid. The co-founder is a psychologist who understands the, you know, the behavioral personality types. The target audience, I would argue, are not middle class moms, but moms, uh, parents in general, but moms in particular who have enough time and money uh, to engage in these like, higher order ways of helping kids beyond just the daily like, stress and normal sort of helping. Um, so solving, solve parenting problems and help kids. That's its purpose. So when we started this project, we started it with trying to figure out what, how this should appear to the world. And we use something called mood boards to do this. So this is really a, a branding and visual design exercise. And it's part of the creative process to just, before you even design features, before you worry about which particular you know, screen layout or information architecture or anything like that, you got to think about what kind of a mood are you setting how do you want people to perceive it when they've come in and just like react to it? How are they going to feel? So we do these mood boards, and I'm going to show you some of them. There's some words, obviously, we're using to like communicate mood. Scientific, technical, intelligent, control, deep, sharp. This is one of the mood boards. Here's another. Very different set of verb, or nouns, or adjectives, sorry. Sophisticated, nurturing, caring, support, elegant, smooth. A very different feel. Human, warm, academic, trusted. How many of you would put academic and warm together? <laughs> Seems like an interesting juxtaposition. Colorful, bright, happy, approachable, young, exciting. You see how these things are casting very different moods and very different sort of branding for the, the colors are different, the images are different. So here's the four choices. This is what we presented to the customer with those important words as part of it. What do you think, given what you know about Kidtelligent, is the best for the company? From, for our target audience, for what it's supposed to do, which one do you guys think best captures it and gives us the best chance of success? Okay, we got like cup of tea, and what else in there do you see that is momish? Mom yeah, that's a big one. Yeah, Nurturing, caring, yeah, yeah. I, I could buy that. Anyone else wanna pick one? Or see? Uh... Let's see what the customer did. This is actually the uh, front page of the app. And what it is, if you look back, it's a mixture of A and B. So I think they picked up on what you were just commenting on about A, for sure. But there were aspects of B, evidently, that they liked, too. Well, actually, I think, I think really D started showing up there, too. I would say A and B. So. This is above the fold, so to speak. It's what you see at the top of your browser without having to scroll. The idea is to hook the reader at that point and get him to continue. How do you think this page does that? What do you see in here that's going to hook people and make them want to click or continue? <laughs> nice. Yeah. That's an important aspect of it. There's a call to action there and like, oh, look, I can save five bucks if I do this before September. Yeah. 
What else is on here to, to hook people? What's this thing in the middle here? Supposedly, but yeah. <laughs> but it's, it, the idea is you're able to identify with this, right? You read these words, and hopefully that creates an emotional response in you about, yeah, I, that was a really painful episode when Billy was being mocked at school and teased, and like I, that was, I felt really bad for him, and I wish I could have helped him better. That was a really hard problem. I can identify with that. That language is very powerful and speaks to me if I've had that kind of problem with my kid. Lots of calls to action here. This is sort of design sort of thing, but you know, I can take a tour. I can just, I'm convinced, get me started, right? I got the big red button. The tour button is a little bit smaller. I can watch a video about it. Or at the very least, I can say, you know, I get this. My kids have a lot of challenges. I care about my kids. I want to find out. So I start scrolling and clicking. A super important part of your language in terms of representing yourself to the world is how professional or not you look. And this is a really subtle thing in the sense that as humans we can make really quick snap judgments on that. So you can look at this and if the graphics were funky or if the language was lame or if there were typos and misspellings, people are going to judge extremely quickly about whether this is on the up and up or whether it's just some you know, dumb hack website that doesn't have any real scientific basis or any value, value behind it as a product, and they're going to move on quick. So sort of as a counter to this, which I think is, is well done, let's look at one that maybe isn't so much well done. Do you look at this and think experts? If you, were, if you were looking for people to help you promote your website and you came across these guys, would you even read all that? Or would you be off already? I think most people would be gone already. It's interesting because I'm sure whoever wrote all that really thought about it, worked hard on it. I haven't read it. It might actually make some sense. I don't know. But it's not effective in the way it's presented. And they're not going to get people to give them the time of day on this. Because they haven't, they've hit them too much, with too much language too soon. Inappropriate language at the inappropriate point. And also it looks kind of cheesy. I mean, when was the last time you saw serious graphics of like those, those words and not getting enough traffic to your website with the like orange highlighting around it? Major cheesy stuff. Come on down in the front. This is like way too small to sit up there. Come on. All the way down. There we go. So when you start out writing a paper, do you just start out writing like this dude did? That's reasonably frontish. How do you start writing a paper? Get someone give me a some new person here, give me a give me your personal approach to writing. What do you what's the first thing you do when you start writing? Brainstorm. Brainstorm, thank you. Good. You gotta think about what the heck you're writing about, right? So you start brainstorming. What's the next step? Research about what you're writing about. You want to be informed. You know what the hell you're talking about. Yeah, good. Okay, we haven't put anything on paper yet, which is interesting. What's your next step in the writing process? I usually just put on paper. You start writing. Interesting. So after those steps of thinking about it, you start. Shh, shh, shh. Yeah. Anyone skip? Anyone insert a step between the thinking and the actual writing of words? Ah, planning and outlining, yes. So that's kind of writing. I assume you record that somewhere, right? But it's not like the words that end up in your paper, right? Well, we have a very similar thing going on in software development. We make an outline too. We don't just start coding. We actually make an outline about where it is we're going and what we're going to do. And it gives us a way of seeing what it is we're doing from the high level. In software development, you would call a outline a prototype or a wireframe. So this is a wireframe. It looks a little bit like a web page, right? It's obviously not a real web page. It's more like cartoon web page. It isn't colored. There are no design elements on it. 
Instead of uh, images, you might just have things with X's on it. There aren't real, there isn't real language here. There's, there's this lorem ipsum thing going on. You can add images like the one below, but there isn't really an image. It's just a placeholder. Much faster to create this, obviously, than it is to like make a high fidelity, high resolution, carefully crafted image of the thing you're building, the web page you're building. So in the same way that it's harder work to start like actually writing the essay directly, it's a lot easier, it would be a lot harder to make this real web page than it is to just start sketching things out. The interesting example or sort of a parallel here about the cost of doing something and when it's appropriate to invest that time. If it's very expensive to write the essay in time, then do you really want to invest that time, that money if you will, at the point where you're not entirely sure where the essay is going and what its bones are, what its structure is, or do you want to find a cheaper, quicker, faster, lower fidelity way of getting a sense of where that thing's going before you invest a lot of time and money in the actual writing? Since, since time in our world is absolutely money, uh, it's important for our customers that we do the outlining, the prototyping. This idea that's common, I think, between writing and software development is one of revision and iteration. I'm a very good writer, and I don't write, I don't get it right the first time. I don't get it correct the first time. And I spend time way before I start actually trying to write the words that I hope will end up in my blog post or my proposal or my email or whatever. I spend a lot of time thinking about what it is, and I use it like an outlining tool or I just use a text file, or sometimes I use eight and a half by 11 note cards and just push them around a table to think about it. And what I've found over the years is that the more time I spend in that space, the better the end product is, and the less time overall the project takes. Because I make fewer mistakes, and I don't write myself down crazy rabbit holes that I then gotta like throw away and back out of. So this is a re graphical representation of how we build software. Um, let me just sort of walk you through this. Hey, Ben tells me I got a nifty, ooh, look at that. So a product backlog is all of the features and uh, stories and aspects that's going to go into the product we're building, the web app or the mobile app or whatever it is. And we call it a backlog because they haven't been done yet. So it's like it's built up and they haven't been accomplished. But we're keeping track of them in, in a single place, all one place. And then we choose a subset from this product backlog that we believe are the most important features, or mo better, that the customer believes are the most important features. And we take that and we create a sprint backlog. This is the amount of work we're going to do in a two-week period. And then we start cranking on doing that work. And th that period of cranking for us is actually one week. More typically, it's, for companies, it's two to four weeks. It's still a relatively small amount of time for a project that might last nine months. This big cycle here, two to four weeks, is a lot, long, a lot shorter than the nine months that the project's gonna take, but it's also a lot shorter, uh, it's also a lot longer than uh, what we're doing on a daily basis. So we get together in the morning, we have a stand-up meeting, we talk about what we're working on, we uh, make sure that it's clear in our heads at the high level, and then we go and actually do the detailed writing, if you will. At the end, what's coming out of this two to four week cycle is a product that we could theoretically and potentially ship. Like it's done, it's tested, it makes sense because we thought about it in you know, this iterative fashion and we're producing something incrementally. So in, as, as a writing process, I don't know if you guys get taught a writing process or not, but as a writing process, there's some similarities here, obviously with a much finer, a much tighter time loop since I hope you don't take two to four weeks to work on you know, simple essays, for example, but nonetheless, there's an iterative nature here that I think is common and valuable. There's another view of software as a persuasive or as a, as a piece of writing that I think is interesting, and that's as thinking about software as a persuasive essay. When we put a web app together or a mobile app together, what we're hoping to do is to convince people to use it. Now there are some kinds of products we build where you don't have a choice. You work at this company, it's an internal application, if time tracking is a real common example of this. You don't track your time, you don't get paid, and then you get fired. So you have to use it. 
In that case, you don't have to be persuasive. You just have to use it. But like kid intelligent, if we don't convince moms that this is going to help their kids and be worth 20 bucks a year or whatever it is, then they just won't buy it. And that company will go out of business. It'll fail. So very persuasive. So think about, here's an, here's an interesting way of looking at this from the software perspective, the creative process of software rather than writing. Optimizely is the product we're trying to sell here. And we're going to try different ways of persuading because we don't know what's going to be persuasive. And I think this is actually a place where software development has some advantages, some inherently different advantages over writing in that you can actually test what you're doing, what you're building, to see whether it is persuasive or not. So you do that by coming up with alternatives. You form a hypothesis, like the hypothesis over here is that it's enough to describe with a simple image and the words Acme widgets and a buy button, all sort of gray monochrome, that's enough to get people to buy our widget. And we know, because this is like what we're doing right now, status quo, that $1,000 in sales results, for, results from this approach. So that's our sort of baseline. How persuasive are we? When we think about other ways of doing it, we might come up with these alternatives, or these, these two alternatives. What if we have a red button? Well, maybe that's more persuasive because people like see red quicker, and maybe they're more likely to click on it. On the other hand, red sort of screams out problem to me. So maybe you don't want anyone wants to click on a red button. Maybe blue is a more persuasive color. Well, the cool thing about software is we can try both. And so we put both out in the world, and we measure which one works better. So variation one, in this case, 4.5% of the people clicked on the red button, and only 3.5% clicked on the blue button. So we know the red button's going to be a better strategy because we can actually measure it. Off the top of my head, I can't think of a way to do this in persuasive writing in the English language because you usually don't get to get inside people's heads and measure what they're feeling or the side effect you're having. So there's a, an advantage we have in, in software development there. We put this one into place after we've found out that it works better, and bingo, we get more, more sales. I don't know how many of you have looked at a uh, computer program recently. Are college students still forced to take some kind of computer programming class as part of your gen ed or anything? How many, how many people have actually written a computer program? Pretty small minority. That's interesting. Hmm. Too bad for you. Oh, I'm sorry. Anyway, this is, this is code. I think this is in Ruby, a language called Ruby. And, uh, What's interesting about it, if you've never looked at a computer program, if you have looked at a computer program, you'd look at that and say, wow, I can almost read that. Like, it's almost English language, which is an interesting trend that's been apparent in computer programming for the last 20 or so years of having computer languages that are more like human languages. And so you're more, you can be more expressive and you tap into the part of your brain that's already good at writing in the human languages. Drew likes to think about a program as like a giant choose-your-own-adventure poem. I wonder what the heck he meant by that. Let's think. Choose-your-own-adventure poem. I think I know what he meant by that. So when he's in, when is it, computer programming is a highly creative act. You are creating something out of nothing. And the interesting thing about computer science is the raw material you have to create is infinitely malleable. As a civil engineer, I get to use steel, and concrete, and other things like that. Those materials are well understood, well studied. They have real physical limits. You can only bend steel until it breaks or twists or bends so much. Concrete, you know, can hold a certain load before it cracks and fractures. You can make a steel, a concrete span so long before it'll snap in two, you know, things like that. Physical properties determine what you can do and constrain what you can do. In computer science, in programming, in that creative act, creating a program, there are no constraints. It's all up to how smart is Drew, how creative is Drew, or the programmer doing the work. 
So in that sense, he's creating his own adventure when he's writing code. And he can spin his own world and make it whatever he can dream up and whatever he can maintain. At some point, it gets too big for one person. It gets too big for a team. The complexity overwhelms you, and maybe it all falls apart. But it's very flexible in that regard. So it's a lot like writing uh, fiction. Invent your own world. OK, now I'm going to hit some of the less sort of esoteric and the more practical things. And I'm going to talk about this as a business owner and a person who's hired. Well, we have 33 people at the company now. As you saw from the picture, it's a pretty young uh, crowd. The average age, I think, is 31 at our company. And uh, that's, there are very relatively few uh, people as old as I am. So there's a lot of 20-somethings. Um, so I have an interesting perspective, I think, for you guys who care to have jobs someday, is that I am an employer who hires college grads. And I want to share with you what I look for, what we care about as a company. That seems rather relevant. So one of the aspects of writing that we can't not do well at is email. It's a strange medium, email. It's something that we use, obviously, day in, day out with our customers, internally with ourselves. Your email represents you in a way w w when you're not there, in a very risky way. Like, you're not there to show me what a smart, intelligent, nice person you are. You don't get the chance to give me those personal eye contact vibes in your body language. You get represented through your email. And if you're sending a mail to a customer, that's what's happening. If you're sending a mail to try to persuade me to give you an interview, that's what's happening. That is you to, to me at that mo moment in time. And if you think about all the things that's missing, all the channels that are, are missing there, all the personal stuff, then it puts a lot of pressure on the writing. Grammar and spelling, huge. I will just throw away an application that we receive through our, our channel for hiring if it's full of grammar and, and spelling and typos. I just won't even look at it. If I get a rambling, huge, long email, even if it's with good grammar and no spelling and typos, I'm much less likely to read through that whole thing. So it's got to be succinct. It's got to communicate your point. And it should try to not communicate too much at once. Classic mistake I see being made at, uh, at, at work when it comes to customers' emails we have a lot of times when we need to get some information out of a customer. Those, our customers inevitably are busy people. Uh, they're oftentimes they're leaders of companies or they're you know, heads of marketing or they're new product development people. They got a lot on their plate. If we send them an email with five questions in it, guess how many we're likely to get answered in the response? Yeah, one at most. What happens to the other four? We don't get an answer. We make it up. Oops, we got to send another mail. So easy lesson to learn here is keep your mails limited to one thing you want to communicate, one thing you want to know. There's another kind of writing that's super important at Atomic. And I would argue any services firm or any internal or any product firm internally, and that is just communicating the status of something, whether it's a project or a product or your job responsibilities. So common one for us is communicating with customers to tell them where things are at. Where, where is your project today? How many features have we built? How much money have we spent? What is our current thinking about when we'll be complete? Status, time, money and time. People are sensitive about money and time. So super important to be communicating clearly about this stuff, clearly and unambiguously. Another place that we um, need oftentimes to communicate with our customers in written form is for requirements. The traditional way of doing software development is all about writing English language documents. And we are not that way, particularly. And we are not that way because that turns out to be a very uh, poor way of getting a sort of mutual mind share about what it is you're building and why you're building it. To have somebody sit in isolation and write a big, long you know, a Word document, and then take that document and just pass it off to a development team to build it, because that's what's required, is a poor way of working, as, as it turns out. But even when you break it down like we have, and we work in very short iterations, 
and we're working very closely with the customers and we're talking with them as much as possible, there's still a need for communication and words that are in the air can be dangerously slippery and ambiguous. Plus, they just stay in the air, they disappear. So they need to, it needs to be written down and that's a requirements update, if you will. So it usually comes in the guise of a question through email or a, a, a project management tool. And then we hope to get back from the customers a written response answering the question and describing what it is that it, they want or explaining something to us that we need to know. So this is really almost formal language in the sense that they're telling us what we should do and what the priorities are and how something should operate. <clears throat> Another form of project update that's critical and oftentimes is uh, done with language is showing what you've accomplished. Um, this is a critical aspect of doing this sort of work because what you're going to be judged by is how well you met the customer's expectations. And if you don't have those expectations written down somewhere, it's very difficult to remember what they were, and it's very difficult to be sure that, you, that your customers knew what you were thinking. So those expectations about how much you'll be able to accomplish, how long it'll take, when it'll be done, how much it'll cost, what it'll look like, these things are written down somewhere, and then you're reporting against that. We got X, Y, and Z done this week. We didn't get A done. We ran out of time, or it turns out we don't understand A. This stuff's really, really important. Absolutely critical. We, we won't hire somebody who we don't think can be an effective communicator because we want every one of our uh, people, whether they're developers or designers or testers or analysts, we want all of those people to be able to be exposed to our customers directly. This makes us a little bit different because you know, in a development shop like ours, it's more common that you have these people who don't like other people and they don't talk and they always wear headphones and they uh, eat Cheetos and drink Mountain Dew and they live in the back in a little cubicle. <laughs> Someone like throws them in requirements and they crank out code and they never talk to the customer because God, you couldn't possibly trust Drew to talk to the customer. Well, we don't want those kind of Drews. We want Drews who can communicate effectively with the customer and manage all of these things both verbally and in written language. So because of that, one of the things that we do in our hiring process, the first thing we do in our hiring process is we ask you to respond to one of four or five questions, uh, essay questions, and write a short essay responding to those questions. Now, there are people who also say, hey, would you mind if I do, did a different question? And that's always fine but we prompt with four or five questions. And it's really interesting to me to see the variety of stuff that we get back. You know, we say, take your time, this is important, we wanna know how you think, it's important how you communicate, the quality matters. Sometimes we'll get back, you know, a really, really short paragraph. And sometimes we'll get back, you know, a three or four page well thought out essay. And sometimes we'll get back a page or two that's really tight and good and sometimes we'll get back something that's just full of grammar mistakes and misspellings and disasters like that. Those people don't even get considered, obviously. What we look for in there is, are they communicating clearly? Do we get it, what they're telling us? It's usually telling a story. Like one of our prompting questions is, um, tell us about a time that you had too much work to do, more work than you could get done. College students, anybody experience more work than they can get done? I think so. We all do, right? So tell us about a time that you've had more work than you could get done in the amount of time that you had to do it, and what did you do? That's, that's it. And so we'll get stories back about, a lot, a lot of times about life in college, or life at work, or home, or whatever. And it reveals to us a couple of things. One, can they write decently? Two, what is it about them personally that they're, trying, that they're telling us, like, sort of between the lines, so to speak? Like, how do they tackle problems? What sense of responsibility do they feel? How do they um, communicate? What were their coping mechanisms when they're under stress? There's tons of stuff that you can get out of these essays that oftentimes determines, assuming that the, the, the language in the, in is good, will determine whether or not we bring people in for an interview. We do also use the traditional form of writing for job selection, which is resumes. Um, and this is another one where it's easier to reject somebody than it is to accept them. So I can think of lots of reasons for rejecting you on your resume, and they don't have much to do with the content per se. They ha it has to do with the, um, the care you took in putting it together. 
any typos, any spelling mistakes, poor grammar, psh, trash can. I got a lot of resumes to look at. And I'm looking for an excuse not to interview 100 people. I'm looking for 10 people to interview maybe. So you make those mistakes, you don't even get considered. Assuming you don't make those mistakes, then I'm looking for higher order things. Does it look nice? Is it well organized? Is there a logical flow to it? Does it communicate what I care about as an employer? Remember that persona stuff I was talking about? That, that we use that in computer science and software development to help us think about who it is we're building for and what they care about. Well, that's the way you should look at putting your resume together. I'm the customer for that resume. You're trying to persuade me. You better get in my head and think about what I care about to know what to put on that resume. Critical writing. Another big area that we have to do a lot of and uh, is a form of persuasive writing is a proposal. Almost every one of our customers wants us to put together something that describes the project to them so that they know that we get it and tells us and tells them how long it'll take, how much we think it'll cost, who's going to work on it, the approach we'd take, what we think it'll look like, all that kind of stuff. Super critical, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars on the line with these proposals. Obviously, they have to look nice. They have to be well-structured. They have to be consumable, readily readable. They can't have any mistakes in them at all. And uh, I've got an interesting story about this. Um, one of my key guys, let's call him Mike, is a, a very smart person. He was a student of mine at Grand Valley, computer science major, and uh, also a good head for business. So a really, really good guy in many, many ways. And one of the things I knew about him because I was his teacher was that he wasn't a very strong writer. And since he was an intern with us, this is something that I had been hoping that he would improve upon and encouraging him to think about and improve upon it. He's a very responsible, organized, you know, type A personality kind of guy. So he recognized, geez, this writing is not something I enjoy that much, but it's something that is going to hold me back in my career his job now at Atomic is a, I can't ever remember how you say, five figure, six figure, he's, you know, makes more than $100,000 a year. He does proposals and he is good at this because, or he's successful at this because he found ways of overcoming a shortcoming and that was his, his skill at writing. Um, I, I see this as a positive sign for you, you who think maybe you're not such good writers Positive in the sense that huge motivation to don't limit your career by not being able to write effectively. And also positive in the sense that people who are not naturally gifted writers can become better. I've seen this happen with this guy who's critical to our, our company uh, over the course of the years that he's worked for us. And whereas I used to worry very much about helping him write and proofing and, and, and fixing things, I don't have to worry about that anymore. And it's, uh, so it's a positive story in that regard. The last thing, I think it's the last thing, that I think is critical about writing is thinking. I couple two things together, poor thinking and poor writing. So given that they're coupled in my head, when I see poor writing, I go to poor thinking. If you can't write it down in a coherent, organized, logical, persuasive, succinct, tight fashion, then I believe your thoughts are scrambled. Either you're not that smart or you haven't taken the time to straighten out your thoughts. Very few people have all of those adjectives I just rattled off like instantly in their head. I don't. I use writing to organize my thoughts, to refine them, to test them, to see if they hold water. In the same way that we use computer programs to see if our ideas hold water, if they can work together. We use English language writing to see if the thinking is sound, if it's got holes, if it's got bugs, if it's got logical flaws, if it just doesn't persuade, if it doesn't hang together. That takes time to do. It's an iterative process. I described an iterative process for writing in my own process of outlining while well, we talked about brainstorming and then researching and then outlining and then actual writing. But even in the actual writing, there's iteration going on. So I'll write it down the first time, I put it away, I come back to it tomorrow, like, hmm, this has a flaw. There's like a logical leap here that I'm making that doesn't hang together. I need to fix that. 
oh, wait a minute. It's because my thinking had a flaw. Oh, thank you very much, writing. You just revealed to me that I hadn't fully solved this problem or thought it through in my head. That's an, that's an amazing tool. And it's all because you take the time to write it down and like force your words to show you you don't know what the heck you're thinking yet or your thinking's screwy. Really, really powerful. It's a mirror you can hold up to find out and measure whether you got it figured out yet. On the got it figured out yet part, I also use writing as a means of discovery. I, blogging is probably the best way I can think of that this happens. So for example, very personal thing for me right now, as the leader of a company of 30 people, it's a, as you probably saw from the pictures, it's a pretty informal tight place, you know, casual dress, there's a lot of friendships in the office, people do things socially, there's no rigid hierarchy, you know, I could have been in one of those pictures sitting in a desk just like anybody else, there's no private offices. So it's an environment that we all like coming to, it's an environment we all like working in, big surprise, you get to be friends with the people you work with because you share values and you do the same thing and you have a common purpose, you get to be friends. So this friends in the office thing, I actually have a great blog title that I'll share with you. It's, uh, I'm sure your gener I think your generation coined this kind of wacky phrase, friends with benefits. <laughs> well, this is like friends with employee benefits. Friends in the office. Um, friends in the office are a double-sided, uh, a double-edged sword, especially for people with responsibilities like mine, in that, I like being, having friends in the office, but I wonder about the impact of my friendships on my role as a manager. I wonder about the friendships and the feelings of the, peop of the employees I have who are my friends with respect to the power that I have and the resources that I control. And so this is very you know, raw and emotional for me and I struggle with it. And uh, I use my blog as a therapy, so to speak, of like thinking these problems through. I don't really know yet how I feel. Well, I know, I know how I feel, but I don't really know like, where I come down on this. Should I follow the conventional wisdom of not ever having friends who are employees? That's what most business people say. Hey, if they're your employees, you can't be friends. You gotta maintain this emotional distance. Or should I say, well, screw that. I don't have a conventional company. I haven't set it up that way, and I don't worry about following these sort of conventional wisdoms, and so this is one I'm gonna ignore, and I'm gonna have friends in the office currently the path I'm on and have been for 10 years. Um, I, really, I really need to think through this so that I can come to peace with it and I can communicate my expectations and you know, like have a sort of a path to follow. So I'm using writing as a means of discovering what I feel about this and what makes sense to me and taking these very complicated and jumbled thoughts that are in my head and by putting them down on paper, I can reflect on them and they can speak back to me and I can see like where I might be headed for trouble. And it's been an extraordinarily useful process that I have both for you know, complicated things like the one I'm describing, but also other simpler things, business problems and whatnot. So a means of thinking, a means of discovery. I think that's the end of my talk. I'd be happy to take questions on whatever you guys might be interested in knowing. We don't specialize. We, we believe in uh, expert generalists. So an expert generalist is somebody who can ramp up quickly in a new technology and also in a new um, industry or domain. So um, that gives us a lot of flexibility. And one of the cool things about working at Atomic is you don't become like the guy who writes C++ apps for um, you know, automated guided vehicles for the rest of your life. Yeah. It's also a little harder it puts a lot more demand on our developers and our designers because today they're working on a mobile app. Next month they might be working on a web app. They got to be good at both. Um, you know, right now, what's Drew working on? You remember Jesse? Drew, Drew's working on Priority Health application <clears throat> that helps business managers understand where their spending is occurring and what the health of their employees is and what they might want to work on to make people healthier and reduce their cost. And he's been working on that project, I think, since probably January or so. It's been quite a long time. Um, but he's coming off of that project, and I think the next thing he's going into is going to be a mobile, a mobile app. And uh, Drew hasn't touched a mobile app for probably a year or so. So 
you know, Drew has to be smart and flexible and be investing his own time in, in maintaining his skills across a broad domain. The payoff for this is, as an individual, it's not boring. It's always interesting there's something new. And he maintains a broad skill set. The payoff for the company is we can do a lot of different kind of projects. If you look at our customer base, they're all over the map in terms of size and industry and where they're located. And that's because we don't pigeonhole ourselves. I once, uh, I once read this thing when I was a professor, or heard this, I believe, that when a professor asks a question in class, guess how long that professor waits to have a student answer before he'll either answer it himself or he'll move on? Seven seconds, that's what I heard. Whether it's 35 or seven, I think 35 seconds. If I actually stood here silent in front of you for 35 seconds, you'd be squirming. I'd be squirming, right? So I think it's probably closer to seven seconds. Seven seconds. How many of you can take a question, analyze it, take it apart, come up with a coherent response in seven seconds? <laughs> yeah, that was a seven second answer, and all you can say is not me. Yeah, it's not enough time. It's strange dynamic. I don't know why I'm talking about this, but. That's right. No, I'm also saying I'm filling the space and time to give you a little bit of time to think if you want to have anything you want to ask me. Generate a question. Or not. That's fine, too. See? I just did it. Yes? Yeah, I don't know if that would be persuasive, but I think you could come up with a really um, simple model, economic model of the value of this. You know, what's, what's a, what's a well-written email that gets you a job interview worth? Well, I mean, at our, our shop, the average salary is $75,000 a year. So it could be really, really valuable. Um, you could take it up to the company level for us and say, I'm writing a response email to a customer I just had a phone call with, and if I undo the good work I did on the phone, or if I am sloppy or hate or, or send too much information or don't send the right information or have you know, mistakes and typos, then I might blow a $100,000, $200,000, $500,000 project. That's pretty darn expensive for not taking the time or having the skills to write an effective email. The thing, I have a 19-year-old at Michigan, and uh, I tell both her and her brother, a 16-year-old, who, um, you know, are this a little bit just behind you guys, I guess, but maybe not much, that um, whatever you study in college, you better come out a good communicator, and that's written and, and verbal. And uh, I think, because of what I was saying about the process of discovery and thinking that writing can help you with, that if you do come out a good communicator, you also come out a better thinker. And so you're getting skills that are lasting and way outlasting anything else you're going to learn. Even if you're taking a very like, specific and detailed course of study, like computer science, the stuff you learn there, a lot of it is very uh, uh, time sensitive and it won't be relevant after a few years. You'll either have learned new things and moved on or you'll be in deep trouble career-wise. But your writing skills and your communication skills, regardless of what you do or where you go, I mean, unless you find a way of isolating yourself from the world, are going to be critical. You need to be able to persuade. You need to be able to communicate effectively. 
So it makes sense to me that we should all be English majors in that sense, because that's a really, really important skill. So especially, here's a good, like a counter indicator. Do you not like speaking in public? Do you not like writing? Do you feel like you're not good at it? Well, these are all really, really positive indicators that you should take more of it, because it means you need to work on it. So don't avoid it because you don't like it, and don't avoid it, and only do it because it's required. Look for the opportunities to get better at it. And I'd be willing to bet, if we could, if we could set up terms for this, I would literally be willing to bet that in five years, in 10 years, you're going to look back and say, holy moly, I'm successful because I can persuade and I can communicate it clearly and I can organize my thoughts and communicate that. I'm not, pers I'm not successful because of you know, something I learned that has to do with my, whatever my career or discipline is. It's successful, I'm successful because of these skills. Thanks for listening.